Welcome to A. Alfred Taubman Night at Lawrence Technological University, and uh, we have a we have a, a very busy program. Uh, and uh, first of all, just with a couple of announcements, uh, next week, part of our Taubman lecture series, uh, Leslie Kino will be here, and that is next Thursday night, uh, April fifth at seven p.m. And, it's, and, uh, Mr. T and with Mr. Taubman's uh, good sponsorship, we're bringing him in. And uh, how many people know Les who Leslie Kino is? Okay, right, Antiques Roadshow, very well-known person, national figure. And, uh, and uh, it's, it's going to be a great time for all of us, so we invite everyone to attend. Secondly, um, for those of you, uh, there are some flyers hanging around. Um, <laughs> We're in the business of selling pens here. As you know, we, we own a Frank Lloyd Wright house. And, and like every Frank Lloyd Wright house, two things. Number one, it leaks. And number two, it eats money. We know that, OK? And um, these pens are made by one of our alum, alums, uh, Fred Butters, who's uh, both an architect and an attorney. And they are made from the siding on Affleck House that was, that was damaged and removed. And, and he crafted these pens out of the very cypress that Frank Lloyd Wright um, uh, specified to go on the house. The si By the way, the house doesn't have like big holes in it. I mean, we replaced it with other siding. But, uh, but, the, um, but these, uh, these are handcrafted with a certificate of authentic authenticity that it came from the Affleck house. Uh, and uh, that is the Affleck house. And this is Frank Lloyd Wright, just for those of you that didn't know the difference between the two, and the, the and the pen is at the bottom, and they're just absolutely uh, beautiful. Uh, they are on sale for four hundred dollars, limited edition. There will only be a hundred made. Fifty of them have already been sold, and uh, and so they're moving very well. And there there is nowhere else except here, or through our college, that you can get an Affleck House pen. Special Christmas gift, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's 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 a it's a it's a beautiful pen, uh, and uh, we're we're looking to sell 50 more. Um, now, the next thing on the agenda, I'd like to call up Bryce Gamper, who is uh, with AIS Lawrence Tech, and he's going to tell you a little bit about freedom by design. And why don't you go right behind that microphone, Bryce? Well, you're going to have to you you can pick up the microphone and do it there, but. Uh, I think we got, got it. Thank you. <laughs> Bow ties are coming back in this year, if you didn't know. Um, good evening. As the dean introduced, my name is Bryce Gamper, and I am the chapter president of the American Institute of Architecture Students here at Lawrence Tech. The AIS is a student run nonprofit organization that really drives itself forward with the goals of leadership, education, and service for students in architecture. So Freedom by Design is our main program to give back to the community. Freedom by Design is a way for architecture students to be engaged in completely student-led design build programs within the local community and use their skills as architects to really be involved and be engaged with uh, benefiting someone else's life. The Freedom by Design program this year has really excelled. We have done six projects in the past year and a half, which is just unheard of for most Freedom by Design programs. We've gone from building a greenhouse in downtown Detroit's Edison district for urban farming. We've designed the plans for a chair, a chairlift and a new ramp for our client in Southfield, Michigan. And we have also begun working with the Veterans Association of Downtown Detroit on their women's housing for next year in fall 2012. We'll be working with them and their design. So community service is one of the aspects of the American Institute of Architecture students, and leadership is the other one. This year, we have had a great, great leadership program in our chapter. Um, I myself serve on the national board, the first time we've had a national board member from our student members. We also had 12 of our students run this year for elected positions, which is the largest number of students we've had run for leadership positions ever before, really. Um, we're also hosting the Midwest Quad Conference this weekend in downtown Detroit. 
The quad conferences are an event where students of architecture from all over the Midwest will go to a certain city and really discover it. So this year we were voted by the Midwest to host over 220 students in downtown Detroit to not only showcase LTU and our leadership skills, but also how great Detroit is and all the great things that are really happening in our city. So with that, again, I thank you so much for coming tonight. The Freedom by Design program is completely sponsored through donations and sponsorships of materials. So out in the lobby, you will see our Freedom Silent Auction items, and I do invite you to visit us after the lecture tonight. The tables will still be open. Some of the bid, uh, beginning bid prices will be lowered for the, at the end of the event. So please revisit them. Please bid and help us ensure that Freedom by Design will continue next year. Thank you so much. Thank you. And, uh, we really appreciate the fact that this is the second year that Mr. Taubman is associated with this event. He brought Michael Graves in last year, and we really appreciate that. And, uh, and he's here himself this year, and he's shown a real commitment to us and our student body in doing this. Um, to, to highlight the importance of this, this is the way they raise the money to do their projects. So when you bid on items, it goes directly into the, to, to helping people in the community gain access to their houses. So be as generous as you can. If you don't want to bid on any items, they do take donations, too. <laughs> OK. Next, we have um, uh, a special presentation. And I'd like to call forward uh, Jim Ryan, one of our great alums, one of our distinguished uh, alum alumni. And Jim, you have a presentation to make. Uh, Alan, in 1966, when I graduated from this university, I had already spent 10 years here at the evening school. So when I graduated in 66, I had already worked for maybe four or five architects in the metro area. And I was at the end of that reign of going to school, getting my registration, and trying to decide what I wanted to do. I was very, very lucky uh, coming upon an architect that had some retail already and had just landed a major project. And so I talked to him, and he hired me to come in on a Saturday. The architect's name was Y. Yi. And Al, I think you know Y. Yi had worked for you for quite a few years uh, through the development of your company. Y took me on a Saturday afternoon uh, to Oak Park on North End Boulevard. And we parked and walked past this luxuriously uh, beautiful limousine with a chauffeur out in front. I believe that was Gene at the time, his name. And we walked in the building, and it was actually closed. Uh, there was nobody in the building. So we walked down the hallway, Wa and I, kind of feeling our way through, knocked on the cement's door, and we heard a loud, come on in. And so we walked in. And here was Al, my first introduction to this major developer who was going to be instrumental in my career. And he was standing there on a stool with a jacket on and no pants. <laughs> he had his boxer shorts on. and. Uh, he was being tailored for a suit with a very big stogie in his mouth, in his, in his mouth at the time. Well known for the stogies, Al. Uh, that began for me a whole new genre of language that I had to learn about the retail industry. Such things as, of course, land development, land balancing, uh, anchors. And I thought that was a nautical term, but that uh, applied to, of course, the large department stores that are going to be in these shopping centers. Things like uh, lease lines and lease depths and uh, floor area ratios to common area, common area maintenance, CAM costs. And of course, that word I had to figure out a long time was worms. What the hell were worms? Worms were the back of house, of course, on these shopping centers. And from that moment on, a whole genre of language, almost over the next 10 years, was being taught to me by Al and his staff, I might add. And of course, in the audience here today, Dick Kuhn. Uh, these were uh, times over that 10 years from 1967 to 1977 that we did projects for Al Taubman, the Al Taubman Company, uh, with YE. Such centers like Northridge and Eastridge and Milwaukee, uh, uh, Portsmouth, not Portsmouth, but Hartford and uh, Connecticut, uh, Forest, uh, Forest Lake, I think it was. and. Uh, Dearborn, certainly in Dearborn, Michigan, Fair, Fair Lane Town Center, and Lakeview Square. That was over a period of 10 years. There were many other plans being drawn. But while those plans were being drawn, while those projects were delivered, just think 
of this man who was teaching not only architects, but many of the new people that he met at that time. He was dealing with the first and top banks in the country, the nationalization of these banks getting loans for the projects he wanted to develop. He was also dealing with, in some cases, the department store executives and their attorneys, but in a lot of cases, even with the families who founded these department stores who were very difficult to deal with. These were deals being made to own land on the property that he took his risk on so they would have favorable locations. Uh, he also met with hundreds of tenants, tenants that came to him and tried to make a deal with him to get into the shopping centers that didn't know anything about shopping centers. So Al took it upon himself in many cases with startups or incubators to tell them how to plan their store. This was the retailer telling the retailer industry how to do it, whether it was locating a door, or whether locating a cash register, or merchandising the store. Al knew how to do it and was constantly teaching. That's my point of this discussion. Uh, from that, he was also simultaneously dealing with uh, cities that didn't want the project there. So uh, archaic ordinances, uh, codes that had to be rewritten. And as the architects for the projects at that time, we were listening, learning, and redeveloping. And even though he had his own priorities of how things wanted to be, he was also open-minded to the creation, the entrepreneurship of bringing new ideas to the, to the, uh, to the station. Uh, this went on for those 10 years. And by the time, uh, 19, uh, well, 1967 was also the year of the riots, so it was a fortuitous time to start doing design work here in Detroit. And in 1973, I think, opened the East Ridge Shopping Center that you had developed. But by that time, uh, in 1978, I had moved on and finally felt through all those years, through those teachings, and the things that I had learned from Al and Dick and company, notwithstanding, I opened my own office in 1978 uh, for the next 30 year genre of development, facing a whole new breed of uh, retail development, still working in some cases for Al, not exclusively, of course, uh, and working around the country. And then I think we worked in 23 states and four continents. So Al, it's your stewardship, your trust, and your faith in uh, myself over those years that led me to uh, become the kind of architect that Lawrence Tech provided the background for, but you brought out. So I thank you for that. And I want to congratulate you on the 2012 uh, Legend of the Year Award. I'd like to call uh, Mike Zielinski uh, up here. He's the uh, uh, industrial management graduate in 1974 and uh, is president of the uh, Legends Entrepreneurial Alumni. Thank you, Jim. Um, the Legends, oh, this works now? Okay. Um, the Legends is a group that uh, was formed uh, just four years ago. And um, our mission statement uh, is to, uh, as an organization, to develop entrepreneurial spirit amongst the students and bringing the alumni uh, back to campus to work with the students and fostering their uh, future uh, as an entrepreneur and to uh, tell their stories of, of their lives and how they got to be an entrepreneur from uh, their days here at Lawrence Tech and onward. And uh, we've got, uh, I think, a wonderful candidate this year uh, as our uh, awardee. Um, matter of fact, uh, this is the second year that we've given this award and uh, both of the uh, recipients are architects. So I want uh, Jim to... Uh... Okay. Well, on behalf of uh, Lawrence Tech University and the Legends Alumni Association, I'd like to read this to you. Uh, in honor of exceptional entrepreneurial achievement, A. Alfred Taubman, honorary doctorate, 85, is recognized as the 2012 Legend of the Year. 
Whereas A. Alfred Taubman, as founder of Taubman Centers, built one of America's most successful real estate development firms located in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan, and whereas as, dean of, dean, as design entrepreneur, his pioneering innovations in modern retailing created a whole new genre of development in the United States, and whereas he has demonstrated extraordinary commitment to higher education both in Michigan and nationally with support of Lawrence Technological University, the University of Michigan, Harvard University, Brown University, and the College for Creative Studies. And whereas he has enriched our community with support of health-related research and philanthropy to cultural institutions such as the Detroit Institute of Arts, and whereas he has become the largest donor in Lawrence Tech's history, I have to stop there for a second, if transforming the campus with LEED certified, silver certified A. Alfred Taubman Student Services Center, redesigned quadrangle, and the Oak Hems Wedge Sculpture, and whereas he has taught the real estate practice, land development graduate course in Lawrence Tech U a College of Architecture and Design, and sponsored the college's annual lecture series, bringing to campus world-renowned architects and designers, and whereas he has participated in the Lawrence Tech American Institute of Architects Students Fundraiser Freedom by Design, benefiting people with mobility challenges. Therefore, be it resolved that A. Alfred Taubman be named 2012-2012 Legend of the Year for his outstanding accomplishments in service to humankind and for his entrepreneurial journey that presents achievement, innovation, sharing, building, and a commitment to all that is good. Presented this 28th day of March 2012 by the Board of Directors of the Legends of Lawrence Tech University, the Organization of Lawrence Tech Entrepreneurial Alumni. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. have a seat again because we have a couple more things to, to show before we uh, all right and uh, let me whoops okay we'd like to start with a film Pontiac was a freestanding city it wasn't really part of Birmingham and Detroit. They were very freestanding cities and, and uh, had about 60,000 people at the time. I was born in 1924, but I don't feel like 88. I'm still very involved with everything. I keep very much attuned to what I'm trying to, what's going on. Five years uh, from my birth, uh, the Great Depression occurred. And uh, uh, our family were affluent, uh, and uh, my father, who was a farmer and a builder, but he basically lost everything. I mean, everybody lost everything. He, he didn't, uh, he never went bankrupt. And uh, he, uh, although all his friends did, uh, and he wouldn't go bankrupt, and he paid the bank off every dime. It took 10 years, but he paid everything off. And that was tough on the family, too, because money was very scarce. And uh, it was not a good time to be, be growing up. I, um, went to work for Charles Agri, who was an architect, local architect, who, um, who did a lot of retail design and so forth. He represented Cunningham Drugs, and he represented federal department stores, not federated, but federal, which was a local uh, chain. When I was working for Agri, uh, there was a lady that came in 
one day, and I was a fairly good delineator. And I was, I, as uh, the client would talk, I would draw based on what they were talking about. And Mr. Agri was obviously not happy with what her ideas were. Uh, she wanted to do salons. After I went out on my own, I was looking for work because I had a couple of things going. And I said, Mr. Agri, you might remember that lady that came in about the uh, bridal salon? Would you mind if I, mind, he says, please go to her. It's a good experience for you getting started. <laughs> so I did, I did some sketches based on the way she described it. She turned around and gave me a huge kiss, which almost blew me away. <laughs> but, but, uh, and I worked out a deal with her and I built, I des designed it. I built the building and I did the fixturing for her. So I, uh, I made good money. This was a big break. I developed it. I didn't invent it. Uh, matter of fact, if you go to Milan, Italy, you'll see the, the Manuel's uh, door, uh, too. Uh, that's the famous, uh, at the end of the cathedral, I went and visited that because I wanted to see how the customers were drawn through it to the cathedral. And being good Catholics, they went to church uh, almost every day and sometimes more than once a day. And they would walk through the mall and I wanted to see if they stopped and bought things, which they did. It was very interesting to me and I, I realized that anchors that is, the department stores, were very important in terms of building a center. I don't think uh, the web, as an example, is going to take over retail. I really don't. I just, uh, people want to see and feel and touch and try out goods. And uh, they'll never really be able to sell shoes. Maybe stock shoes or rubber shoes, or, but uh, better price shoes they'll never be able to sell because they have to be tried on. I think there's a, a lot in having to be there and touch and feel, plus the fact that it's an experience. In order to have a successful retail, you have to have customers. You have to be able to justify a quarter million customers that uh, theoretically are yours. And we've done a number of centers in, in the middle of downtown. And they've been generally successful. And we're building one right now. Uh, we're building a, a center with the Mormon Church in Salt Lake City next to the Tabernacle. Has a roof that opens up, which is the first one I know of of this. I, and because uh, the city fathers couldn't make up their mind whether they wanted a closed center or an open center. So we gave them both. The one that I always sort of uh, think about is ice, er, ice skating rinks. We built 12 of these I'm, uh, throughout the west and east. Uh, I always used to think they were important to the center, and uh, and I think they were to some degree. Uh, when the cost of coal went up and the cost of electricity, of course, followed it. Uh, ice is made with electricity, and uh, the cost of the electricity more than tripled. And all of a sudden, I took a hard look at this, and I started having people count the number of people that were using it, it made no sense. So, but it was a big mistake. I, I ate 12 of these. <laughs> they weren't very good as far as digestion was concerned. In the past, we had one of the greatest architects in the world, Albert Kahn. I think Albert Kahn was, uh, hugely talented man, 
and really set up the standard for architecture. Uh, I think he was a very important architect for America. As most know, he was the one that designed the line, although Mr. Ford took it, <laughs> always took credit for it. It was he that came along and said, instead of building vertically and passing things down, here we have enough land that we can go horizontally. And they said, well, how are you going to get the goods onto the car? Well, he said, we're going to put it on a chain, put the car on a chain and drag it along on a chain. And the workman will put it on as it goes by. Well, that was a, a brilliant idea because nobody had ever thought of that. I believe that architecture is a good choice because it's not only it's not only a question of buildings. It gives you a creative mentality that you can go out and do an awful lot of other things. And the work I had that I was trained in in architecture, both in the school and outside, which was still just as important, uh, was was great background for whatever I did because it's a cross of art and science. Uh, in the year two, uh, 2050, the demographers tell us we're going to have 125 million more people. That's 40 percent increase in our population, 40 percent increase in terms of jobs, automobiles, whatever are going to increase. People are going to have to do that. Alfred Taubman, have a seat here, and we got to get your uh, microphone turned on somewhere. They turned it on up there. Oh, you're on. Okay, great. great. Yeah. Well, have a seat, and we have a we have a little time to ask a few questions. Uh, if anyone from the audience uh, has some questions along the way, uh, just let us know. And uh, who has the microphone that's hanging around? Okay and they'll find you and we have you know we'll take some questions along the way rather than afterwards the first question i have to ask you though is um, you know cities are are huge undertakings and there's all kinds of different forms of development in cities and you could in becoming a developer you could have chosen almost anything you could have chosen housing you could have chosen office you could i know you, you've done some office and, and things like that but you really staked your career on retail development. Why did you do that? Why choose retail? <laughs> well, early on I looked at different forms of the development and I experimented. And uh, I found retail to be the most satisfying as far as I was concerned. A number of reasons. <clears throat> First reason is you get an opportunity to be in business with a retailer. Theoretically, in a, in a uh, office building, you rent space and uh, you sit as a landlord, uh, period. You pay taxes and you hope that the increases that you're able to get will overcome the taxes that you're going to pay on the cost of maintenance. And if you do, re if you do residential, you sit in a, even a tougher position because your tenant can move out the following day that you make a deal with them. If you give them some sort of right to, to uh, money to move in. Uh, in hotels, it's pretty much the same thing. 
The only difference is you rent it for one night instead of month by month. So your danger of everybody moving out every night, you have to release it the following day. With retail, you have an opportunity to rent to someone who is substantial enough uh, to be there for at least six, seven, eight years that you plan on renewing the lease. And in the renewal, you can the tenant has an opportunity to upgrade to the kind of uh, space he's using in terms of bigger space or smaller space. That's more congruent with his, the kind of business he's doing. And he has the opportunity of going through and experiencing that business and profits and so forth. And depending on the strength of your center, and that's the responsibility of the developer, he has a responsibility to return that space and to give that tenant an opportunity to see the enough, enough customers that he can pay the rent and make a profit. And uh, I'm proud of our company because we do we did $641 a square foot average, which was almost $100 a square foot more than anyone in the business in America. And uh, I know that's just a number, but it just a number relates back to the success of the tenants. Not a bad number, though. Not a bad number. <laughs> You know, uh, one of the things that was shown in the film, and we've talked about this, and when you did our, our course here at the university, uh, you talked about it extensively with the student, and that's the role of historic precedents. And you, you saw, you've always cited the, uh, the, the fabric bazaars in Persia in the 14th century, and, and uh, this in the film, uh, the uh, uh, Vittorio Emanuel duo. Um, and. Uh, when you see this, and you, you kind of described it in the film, but can you, can you describe what we're looking at there? Yes, uh, the cathedral is here. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a... That's the cathedral, and that's the mall. And the residential, residential and commercial development is extensive uh, to the north. And the easiest path to take, and if it's raining, it's a, a lot nicer path, is to walk through the mall to get to the cathedral. The cathedral acts like a department store. It's a people pump, as I call it. And the people pumps give you an opportunity where your customer gets to see the merchandise and maybe has an incentive to buy. And uh, otherwise, you're just stores. If you can't deal as a unit, and if you don't have an opportunity to bring customers there, for just more than just the stores that you're, that you're presenting, it, it's difficult to do major business without some pump brain customers for some reason in terms of size, domination of, of goods or, or the kinds of goods you're selling. Uh, <clears throat> that's what makes customers want to go further perhaps to get to your center. And when you get on the inside of the mall, um, it's beautiful. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's beautiful, but are, are there any lessons that you took from, from looking at this particular setting that you took to your projects? Well, uh, we, it's interesting. If you looked at our new center in Salt Lake City uh, that you saw inside, uh, we, this is offices above the retail. But we, and uh, there was some, re, some residential at the top. I don't know whether it's still there. I think it's principally offices. But uh, you can see it's uh, lovely stores, easy to walk, an interesting space. It's, uh, and, uh, but the space is like clouds. Once you see it, you're then looking at the shops. That's what's important. To, to, to the extent, and this is Salt Lake, and you referred to it, and there's the temple in Salt Lake yeah. City, and, and yeah. this is your project. Yeah. I mean, is history repeating itself, in a sense, in a different, in a different location? Well, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it works. I mean, we, we just opened last Thursday. Yes, and this, and, is, uh, and this is a project from the air. I think it's a beautiful project, and uh, it was designed uh, principally by... Uh, uh, by one of your alumni here, 
and uh, by a couple of your alumni here, and saw the project through. I mean, I think it's uh, one of the finest projects we've ever done. Well, let's just take a, this, this is a remarkable project, and an open one, last, last Thursday, right? Or last Wednesday or Thursday? Yeah, yeah last Thursday. Yeah, and, um, and let's just take a few looks at it, and then I want you to comment on some of the special features in that, in that. this is a... Uh, this is a bridge over Main Street. It was very important that we tie the traffic on both sides of the street, uh, because Macy's are down at this end and Nordstrom's are at the other end. And all you, you have a passage at the ground level here. I thought it was important that the upper level all tie, tie together. This was a big thing we had to work out with the community. Uh, because, uh, and we weren't really hurting these, the flow of traffic or view because the, the uh, Mormon tabernacle is right at the end of the street. So. Uh, it wasn't uh, wasn't a problem, but in terms of view, or we didn't uh, tie up any traffic or anything like that. But it was a major thing. This is in a courtyard outside of the center. But, uh, it's it's lovely. It's a nice uh, water and uh, and uh, trees and so. On. This is the main mall here at the upper level. Those are two levels of condominiums at the top. They're about half sold out. Very nice condominiums at the top. And this is with the roof open, right? Pardon? This is with the roof open. The previous one was roof no, closed. No, he's not involved. No. no, that's roof closed. Oh, he bought one. Yeah, yeah you're this right. Is, this is the roof open. Yeah, he bought one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There, there's some other features, though, too. Like uh, th there was a river that, uh, that yeah. uh, a historic yeah. creek or a river that flowed through uh, Salt Lake City, and how did yeah. that interact with the project? Well, when they when they went to, when they were coming across with these rickety uh, uh, desert trailers, or you know, uh, with horses and so forth, as they as the Mormons made the trip across the country, and he was looking for a place. Uh, Brigham Young was leading. Mr. Smith had been killed, who was the founder of the of the of the Mormon. Our church, and uh, uh, Brigham Young then took on the responsibility, and uh, they had a lot of problems as a as a as a community, and uh, he chose to take uh, the entire community west, and when he got here, there was a river, very clean, fresh water and river, and he said, "This is the place." And they stopped, and they built the city there. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty amazing. And they built, they laid out this tabernacle at that late, at that date. They first built the tabernacle. They built houses, and and they built the city. There's a copy on top of the bridge, the main bridge that I showed you earlier. There's a cast iron plan of the city, uh, dated 1878 that shows the grid as the way the city was and the way it grew. It's rather interesting. Uh, they had planned this in 1878. It was pretty impressive. And they followed that plan. So, you know, planners do make good judgments. <laughs> <laughs> this, this particular project yeah. uh, uh, with the opening and closing roof, the incorporation of the, of the creek uh, or the river that was there, the uh, uh, the skywalk bridges, uh, uh, you know, high amenity. I mean, it cut, it cut new ground for, for retail projects in the United States. Is this a coming movement, or is that particular to this project? <clears throat> I, I think this was the first time anybody ever did a, a, a roof that moved like, like this one. And it's so now is everyone going to do it? A huge piece <laughs> of work. And it's the first, and I think it's the last. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't think anyone has enough money to do this personally. I mean, it was all part of this project, but, mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's a very interesting thing, and uh, it was a very sensitive design that our people did, mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, it works. The, um... it, 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 300 days a year, incidentally, in, in Salt Lake, you have sunshine, which is pretty remarkable. 
especially against here. But anyway, <laughs> three and so consequently, they wanted the benefit of this lovely weather when they have it. <clears throat> and yet the other 65 days, they can have some pretty rough rain and so forth. So that's why they couldn't make up their mind whether they want an open mall or a closed mall. So they got both. <laughs> You know, you've talked a lot, uh, and, and again, you talk to our students about retail space planning, and you've studied downtowns in the United States, particularly after World War II, and, uh, and this is a diagram that, uh, that you use to explain yeah. it to our students. I think the audience would, uh, would, would like hearing uh, what are the things that, that you learned from studying downtowns that you could convey to yeah. them. Well, I, as in the study, I realized the streets were very important, but they were also a hazard. Uh, and if you wanted to rent both sides of the street, which you have to, uh, you, you need a way, you need to close the street. Once you close the street, you, you interrupt the traffic. So the benefit sometimes is, is, uh, is difficult to match against the the disadvantages. Now, assuming you're, you're coming, you're driving into this town, and you park in one of those two garages or two of the lots in the back. Now, the apartment store opens that lot. Of course, this is just a, a fiction of a, of a town. But everybody's basically being drawn to the department store. That may seem... Uh, Many of you shop, and you don't shop in department stores. But traditionally, and I believe this will last many years, department stores are very strong in terms of drawing traffic, even though you may not shop there. The idea that they're there and they have this total complex of all kinds of goods, you know that you're going to find, the trip is going to be beneficial, because you're ultimately going to find, if you can't find it in the shops, you're going to find it in the department store. So, and, uh, and they have the resources and the strength to bring that kind of goods in. So that's why it's an important basic of a, of, of a downtown or any, any retail development. Now, if you park in one of those lots, say you park in this lot between 4th and 5th Street, south of, the, of Main Street, you see where I, the, yes, yep. uh, yeah, Glenn's got it there. I got it here. You park there and you either cross the street and walk down to the department store. When you do that, you walk by those shops or you go to the other side of the street and you walk by those shops. Now, these shops over here, since there's no parking over there, they don't get the benefit of that traffic. So those shops over there, are what we would call 100% locations. So here are, now that could be divided based on the shops on the other side with the other parking and so forth. And that's one of the reasons that we put the department store. Early on when, when Hudson's built the centers here, they built, they, they were, their whole purpose of the way they operated is they wanted to eliminate traffic. I mean, a big problem, eliminate competition. They hated competition. And uh, that's why they built the center with one department store. There were other people that wanted to go. Sears would have gone at the time. We were very strong in the suburbs. And other stores would have come in and compete with them. They really didn't believe in competition. They wanted to get full markup. They weren't a very competitive department store. And uh, they did a lot of business here. And now when they, so we put the department stores at the end, like, the, like, like in Milano, where, they, where, the, where the, the, the Galleria is on one end, and the cathedral is on the other end, is on one end. So you'd be draw through the Milano center to the, to the main, to the church. Well, it's the same theory here. You're walking by stores. But on the other hand, you have a street that's, that's separating the traffic. And you have the concern of, of cars going back and forth and stops and so forth. And you have to be able to find your way across. And then you miss the other shops. Now, 
so we built the shops on the mall. That was the theory of the closed mall. And when we did these things in downtowns, we repeat this. Because the control of the traffic is the most important thing we can do. Because we give the, cust we give the customer and we give the tenant the opportunity to see all the customers. If we can control that traffic, and we do this usually on two levels, it's because the customer goes across one level and back down the other level, which gives the, the stores a full opportunity to see all the shops. The customer sees every shop and has every opportunity to shop. And that's, what we're, that's our business. That's why we do the kind of volume we do, is because we, we plan as to how the customer's going to see the stores, what the stores are, where the stores are located, who's next to whom, who's above and below whom. These are the, th this is the way, if, if we were only going to have one escalator, it'd be at one end. Wouldn't put it in the middle. Because you'd split the traffic. Now, you want me to? No, no, let me ask you, because this is yeah, a little follow-up sure. here. Because uh, this is a, an observation about downtowns in sure. America. And you, you've also pointed out the decline of downtowns and certainly uh, decline and decay. And uh, certainly, if you look at our own city of Detroit, uh, it, uh, uh, we've, we've had decline in downtown. It is not what it, what it was back in the, in the World War II era. And so what do you think is the future of downtowns generally in America now? And particularly, I think most people would be interested, what do you think is the future of downtown Detroit? Well, it's a tough question, but I'll try. I know you will. <laughs> uh, we can only, we, we market to the customer. People shop where they, where they live, not where they work necessarily. Maybe they do for 15 minutes. They'll run in and grab something to get back, but they gotta go back to work. And uh, uh, consequently, uh, we don't, they don't generally shop where they work. They shop at home with their family, at leisure. It's a leisure activity, it's, it's entertainment, it's, it's, uh, it's the value of being with their, their children, teaching them, and, and that's all part of living. In the, and that's why the suburb, you know, the suburbs didn't start now. Uh, in, the ele in the 11th century BC, in Babylon, they had a, they had a, they had a, there was a tombstone they found, or it was a stone they found, that said, we're so happy living in the suburbs. <laughs> there's no dust, there's no mud. It's a wonderful place to live. It's interesting, even then, they wanted to live outside of where the activity was. And they wanted to live where they could shop, outside the activity. If, so, If you were going to look ahead, like, huh? uh, if you were going to look ahead at Detroit 40, 50 oh, years from now, Detroit. what would you, right. what, right. what is it going to look like 40, 50 years from now, downtown Detroit? Well, I believe in the, in the long run, Detroit, which has 138 acres, which needs about 35 to 40 acres, I, square, uh, square miles. miles square sorry. miles, yeah. Not acres, square miles. It could be on 35 to 40 square miles, if you could push it all together. Now, the, when they built the people mover here, they, they thought that could bring the traffic together. Well, it really didn't. It had been cheaper to tear down some of those buildings and move them over. Uh, it cost a fortune of money, and yeah. it cost a lot of money to keep so operating. And people want to operate on foot. That's a, uh, we, God gave us feet so we could walk on them. And it's the most competitive way of moving. Mm -hmm. Now, just look at the town. Look at the way everything is scattered out with all kinds of parking lots in between, roads, and there's no concentration of the space. Downtowns have to be vertical. This is not a vertical city. It's a horizontal city. And had it been, uh, we put retail in the, in the Renaissance. We helped them and put retail in there. It hasn't done too well. 
We did it originally, and we redid it when General Motors came in for them. Mm -hmm. And we, we did the best we could, and it, it, it's doing, you know, it's doing business. But it's not like that, that tenant had made an investment in one of our centers. Mm -hmm. He'd be doing two, three times the business. It's not a great incentive. Right. The, uh, uh, because the customers aren't there. They have to, if it's as easy to drive out as it is to drive in. Mm -hmm. It's the same gas, it's the same trip. And some people think it's even safer to drive out than drive in. So that's the, you've got, and I'm not speaking of it as a, on a negative basis. Detroit is probably one of the toughest cities in America to try to do retail in its downtown because of those reasons. Uh, some critics have said, well, the suburban malls had a lot to do with undermining downtown. Do you believe in that No, criticism? I don't believe it at all because, number one, if the customer wasn't out there, we wouldn't be building out there. We're building to satisfy the mm -hmm. needs of the customer. And that's why we build in the suburbs. We build in the cities, too. Look at City Creek. Yes, exactly. Look at Stamford, Connecticut. I mean, we've built we've built uh, we built a number of centers in the city. So, so uh, when you do your demographic studies, you look at the number of households. We look at the number of households, and we look at the at the quality of the households. We look at sociographics. We look at uh, not only just incomes. We look at how much they spend on food or spoos, shoes or whatever. And we look at incomes, of course, that are important, and what the spendable is. Mm -hmm. And then we, uh, and we make decisions uh, based on the cost of land, the availability of land, the availability of roads, what we can draw in 10 minutes, what we can draw in 20 minutes. These, this is the way we, we, we take a perspective on things. Well, in the uh, United States, uh how important were highways and freeways to the development of your projects? Well, that's what really made us. I mean, without the freeway systems, we, could, we need about a quarter million people that are nearby within about 10 minutes. That's a minimum of what we need to do a center. So if you take, if you take uh, <coughs> on grades, Interceptors, you know, a, a, a road system with lights and so forth. A 10 minute circle generally would have 50 to 60,000 people. But if you have freeway systems, it could have a quarter million people or 500,000 people within a 10 minute radius. You know, this city, this country has, as an example, the city of Detroit. Uh, I forget about say that uh, our average city does about has about 22 people per acre within our cities, and Berlin in 1965 had 178 people per acre or uh, per acre. The difference of density makes a huge difference in terms of what you can support in terms of distance. Now, uh, freeways. Draw, bring people for large distances. Now, in 1966, uh, I, I, we were doing a center in Concord, California. And uh, it's an excellent market. We still own it, called Sundog. And uh, uh, we did this center uh, uh, on the basis, they had already planned the center there. Sears brought the deal to us. It wasn't going anywhere. And uh, it was 72 acres. It was a small site. So, uh, and Sears, and once I did the evaluate, the analysis, I realized that this could take a large center. That they were trying to build 60, Macy's were going to build a 60,000 foot store called the Twig. And I talked them into doing a 200,000 foot store called a branch or a branch store. So that made a huge difference. Sears were building a 122,000 foot store. They raised it to 278,000 feet. Once I pointed out 
we could get this number of people. Well, we build a deck at the lower level, at the upper level, to take up the difference. And we built, instead of building 120,000 square feet of shops, we built 415,000 feet of shops, and then more later. And we built three department stores originally, and one more later. We had Macy's and the Emporium Capwell, Sears and Pennies in the center. Now we, we ended up building about a million four hundred thousand feet, totally. And we started out, that center was gonna be 320,000 feet. That's the difference. The difference would have been that center with on-grade traffic mm -hmm. would have serviced about 50, 60,000 people. Here we ended up servicing probably 400,000 people, mm -hmm. all, half of Contra Costa County, mm -hmm. opposite San Francisco. So that's, that's the reason we need the freeway. We can get traffic, four or five times the amount of traffic with the same time. Mm -hmm. And time is what's important to people. They think of, it's only 10 minutes away, it's only 20 minutes away. They may drive by three other developments to get to one of ours, I hope. Thank you. <laughs> you know, uh, you, you talked a lot tonight about department stores, and uh, this is the, uh, the beginning of the Nordstrom yeah. chain. Uh, they were and, a shoe store. And this is, and this is a, a Wanamaker's, well, you, you once owned this company, yes, we but did. the famous uh, Wanamaker's department store in, in yeah. Philadelphia. And really, one of the one of the questions is, um, um, you know, how did well, how did the, the department store format evolve to what it was today? And number two yeah. is, given the competition from discount uh, department stores or from or from the internet, as you pointed out in the film, is is the department store going to be challenged as a model in the future? Well, they've been challenged for years. Everybody challenges everybody, but you got to look at the history of the department store. In the late 18th century and early 19th century is when the department store really started to come together. And it was basically the reason, I mean, that the noble families in Europe owned most of the land in downtowns, because that's where the palace was, and they owned land around the palace, and, and they would build, they were the builders in those days. And they would build shops on streets, Greg. And at the rear, they'd have an alley. And then some of them found that by reversing that, by reversing the alley to the outside and building a walkway on the inside, they could reverse the stores internally instead of externally. They became, they left both entrances and it became very successful. Now, They'd have, they'd, they'd, they'd started to learn that they needed a complex of different kinds of goods to keep the customer interested and, and make the trip because that's where the different forms of good. Well, a lot of this changed because in those days, uh, sizes were not, uh, were not identified. Uh, sizes didn't occur until uh, the early part of the 19th, uh, the 20th century, when Filings and Wanamakers and, and Marshall Fields were the first ones really to start sizing goods, made a huge difference in sizing. Because up to that time, you'd have to go in and try everything on. See if there were a pair of gloves. You went in and you tried 40 pairs on until you found a pair that fit. Then you had to negotiate the price because the price was, uh, was based on whatever you in the, in, the, in the store came to a conclusion on. So, but anyway, these nobles, when they found they, they had these stores rented, one store would go out and they needed a store, they'd operate it themselves. Pretty soon they ended up operating the whole thing themselves. And that's, a, that's basically the history. But they knew that they needed a, complex, a, a, a compound of different kinds of goods to create interest and to create a shopping experience. And they understood that. And that's how the department store grew, based on size, based on the Industrial Revolution in the late 19th century, where goods were starting to manufacture so everybody could buy goods. Up until that time, you showed a picture earlier of the Fabric Center. They only sold fabrics. 
everybody in their home would go, to, they'd take their goods home, and, they, and the lady of the house, or perhaps the next door neighbor, would piece the goods together and make a jacket or make a dress, and, goods, and the goods were purchased in these fabric centers. And they, you would have maybe 40 different shops selling fabrics, all in competition with each other. You know, that's, that's the coming back to, to, to Hudson's. They made a terrible mistake in Detroit. I mean, it wasn't the shopping centers, as say, that killed downtown Detroit retailing. It was the fact they were operating a 2 million square foot store in downtown Detroit. And they came out to Northland, they built 650,000 feet. When, shop, when they should have been building a branch of 200,000 feet. But they built, they replicated downtown Detroit in, in Northland. They went and make matters worse, they went over on the west side and built another one, mm -hmm. Eastland. So they were competing with their downtown. They, they were the ones that closed their own store. Mm -hmm. That's what they did. They just moved the goods out. And that happened all over the country, though. Because, it? well, because the customers moved out. Mm -hmm. With a 65, 67 uh, problem we had in Detroit, the customers left. Right. They came to the suburbs. I've always appreciated the way that you've incorporated theory with your, with your work. And you talked about it a lot in the class. And, uh, and one of the things that you yeah. brought up was Gordon Cullen and serial vision. Yes. And, and I'm, I'm, can you explain to the audience, uh, I, I know there's, there's some... There's some uh, architecture faculty here that know about Gordon Cullen and yeah. Serial Vision, but other, others may not. I, I brought you that book. Y yeah. <laughs> it's, it's One of my a, prized possessions. It's a book I've owned for many years, and, um, and but, I but, appreciate it. But can you describe the concept of Serial Vision and how yeah, it sure. informed the development of your centers? Sure. It's a, it's a question uh, to create interest when people walk. It's the shops that are important, obviously. But in addition, if you can create big space, small space, narrow space, wide space, you create fascination and interest. People want to look around the corner and see what's there. People want to move through the space. That's what he's done here. He's a very clever uh, uh, author. He, but he did this book, uh, I don't know, 50 years ago, perhaps, 45 years ago. And, uh, uh, and Townscape explains the way serial vision actually works. Mm -hmm. You can see some of it on this. So it's the movement of people through space it's and how they perceive space. It's the movement of people space. through space, where the, where the space, the walls, the ceiling, the floors, all come into effect in terms of how that space creates a sense of feeling with the, with the, with the person walking through. Okay. That's what it is. Let me, uh, okay, uh, we're running out of time because I know you have to catch a plane, actually. Uh, but let me ask two questions that hopefully you can get a couple of quick answers from. Um, one is in uh, uh, perfecting the mall. And uh, the uh, best-selling author, Malcolm Gladwell, wrote in the New Yorker magazine that you may not be the person who invented the modern shopping center, but you certainly are the person who perfected it. And um, now, forgetting your modesty for just a moment, and, uh, <laughs> um, uh, I you know, that a long time ago. <laughs> can <laughs> can you tell us um, what are the elements that you're most proud of in perfecting the modern mall? Well, just there's one thing here I'm not proud of. Okay, those are those are imitation trees. I hate okay. them. Okay. Okay. <laughs> And uh, uh, okay, we didn't we didn't want you to go I the other way with modesty. Them. That happened you know? after I uh, <laughs> I'm no longer in charge. We, we, didn't, but, want, uh, we didn't want you to go into self-deprecation now. Yes, uh, I, know, <laughs> I know. But that's those are uh, uh, my kids that do that because they think that it's uh, they. You see, trees need uh, moisture, and they need they need uh, uh, they need to be able to. To uh, with seasonal change, uh, the tree grows. A trap palm tree grows. It runs a spigot up the middle, and then grows to the spigot. Well, they can't. You know, it's entirely doesn't work. The trees die. That's the reason they got mm -hmm. phony trees up there. 
Okay, that's right. something you're not particularly proud of. Name the things you're most proud of that you perfected. Oh, let, me, let me phrase it that way. Well, it doesn't occur here. Let me see. You don't have to look at the picture. These are just teasers yeah. for you. Yeah, I, uh, uh, I can't remember <laughs> the, all these centers. And it doesn't have to I be think from that, I think that's uh, the second one up on the right, on the bottom, is uh, I think that's Short Hills, New Jersey, which uh, is one of the best three or four centers in America. Mm -hmm. Does about eleven hundred dollars. I know it does about thirteen hundred dollars a foot. You're kidding, aren't you? Yeah, it does. <laughs> very, very wow. successful. Wow. Wow. And uh, this one in the lower right is a center in uh, uh, Dolphin. It's called Dolphin in uh, Miami. That's an off-price center. It's like Great Lakes. We have three of those, and they're doing extremely well. Uh, it's very big. It's like a million, eight hundred thousand feet. It's very, very large. But it, it's they're large not just to be large. They're large because we want as much, many different kinds of merchandise, and we want competition between the merchandise. That's what creates business. That's what creates customers. And that's why it's important that we build them large enough. We keep adding on. That's okay. what happens. Okay. Um, final question is, uh, we have a number of architects here tonight. Yeah, I and, hope so. Yeah. And uh, it, is, it is, after all, a College of yes, Architecture and right. Design. Yeah. Um, but when you're, when you're designing your centers, you have often said that you need, that, ar uh, that the architects need to consider the, the goals of at least three of the parties, the retailer, the shopper there I am and the, the landlord. <laughs> See, here you are reminding us. The, the retailer, the You're shopper, and the one landlord. Person. The banker. The banker. Well, I'm just, I'm just going by what you quoted. And uh, <laughs> if you want me to add the banker, I have to get on the PowerPoint slide and add it right now, and I don't have time to do that. But, but how does understanding the needs of all these players fit into what the architect needs to deal with? Well, it's, you're a team, and you're all trying to create the, the best thing possible for the kind of a budget you have and the kind of a market you have. People have to work together. People have to be uh, team players. No one runs anything. Everybody works together to try to create the best product for the customer. That's really what you're talking about. There's no, there are no uh, bosses. And no dictators, or else you don't have any success. Okay. Success has to do with team play. Sure. And uh, sure, people have to be outstanding in terms of their abilities and so forth. But those are the kind of people you select. That's the job of a, of a, of a, of a, of a producer. Or, you know, that's the job of the, of the entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. Try to select the best people who will do the best teamwork. And architects are key to everything. Uh, they're key to the shops. They're key to the interiors. They're key to the taste. Taste level is very important. Not, uh, fortunately, unfortunately, not everybody has it. And not everybody appreciates everybody else's taste. You know? It's a very individual thing, but it's very important in terms of the way things go together and how they're done and, and as to whether they yell at you or they scream at you or, they, or they're acceptable. You know, um, I've talked to this guy many, many times, uh, interviewed him for the, for the film that you saw. I just think of him as one of the consummate storytellers that I've ever dealt with, and you've, you've exceeded yourself tonight again. <laughs> he was concerned about, gee whiz, what am I gonna say? You know? <laughs> we could have gone on another hour, uh, except that he has to catch a plane. And uh, so, uh, A. Alfred Taubman, thank you so much for, you. for your role thank tonight. You.